it would be extremely painful for you. <coughs> Sorry, uh, I was wearing the mask for the smoke here in Silicon Valley, and it's kind of going to my head a little bit. Uh, hello, and welcome back to Voice Vember Day 2. Yesterday was fun, and I'm glad that I did it, but I can already see some problems brewing. Uh, it's late again, and I just want to go to sleep, but... Damn it, I made a commitment, so here I am. Also, I realized I don't need to wear the studio headphones while recording, since there's actually nothing to listen to. But I choose to do so anyway, because it makes me feel like a boss. Uh, a few modifications. I'm trying a different program that will hopefully produce some higher quality video and audio. Uh, to hit the real heights of quality, I would record the video separately with my phone, and then edit the audio together, but that sounds like work, so no. Uh, also, I'm turning the gain down on the mic and talking closer to it, right here. Uh, so maybe there will be less background noise. This also means that the mic will take up part of the frame, but I guess that just means I'll have to look more legit. Also, I heard some good suggestions for things to read. So naturally, I'm going to completely ignore them and read something totally random. The introduction to An Inquiry into the Nature and Causes of the Wealth of Nations by Adam Smith. Sure. This is the version on Project Gutenberg, and the link is in the description. Or the doobly-doo, or I'm not cool enough as a YouTuber to know what to say. Onward. <clears throat> introduction and plan of the work. The annual labor of every nation is the fund which originally supplies it with all the necessaries and conveniences of life which it annually consumes, and which consist always either in the immediate produce of that labor, or in what is purchased with that produce from other nations. According, therefore, as this produce or what is purchased with it, bears a greater or smaller proportion to the number of those who are able to consume it, the nation will be better or worse supplied with all the necessaries and conveniences for which it has occasion. But this proposition must, in every nation, be regulated by two different circumstances. First, by the skill, dexterity, and judgment with which its labor is generally applied, and, secondly, by the proportion between the number of those who are employed in useful labor and of those who are not so employed. Whatever be the soil, climate, or extent of territory of any particular nation, the abundance or scantiness of its annual supply must, in that particular situation, depend upon those two circumstances. The abundance or scantiness of this supply, too, seems to depend more upon the former of these two circumstances than upon the latter. Among the savage nations of hunters and fishers, every individual who is able to work is more or less employed in useful labor, and endeavors to provide, as well as he can, the necessaries and conveniences of life for himself and such of his family or tribe as are either too old or too young or too infirm to go a-hunting and fishing. Such nations, however, are so miserably poor that, from mere want, they are frequently reduced, or at least think themselves reduced, to the necessity sometimes of directly destroying and sometimes of abandoning their infants, their old people, and those afflicted with lingering diseases to perish with hunger or to be devoured by wild beasts. Among civilized and thriving nations, on the contrary, though a great number of people do not labor at all, many of whom consume the produce of ten times, frequently of a hundred times, more labor than the greater part of those who work, yet the produce of the whole labor of the society is so great that all are often abundantly supplied, and a workman even of the lowest and poorest order if he is frugal and industrious, may enjoy a greater share of the necessaries and conveniences of life than it is possible for any savage to acquire. 
the causes of this improvement in the productive powers of labor and the order according to which its produce is naturally distributed among the different ranks and conditions of men in the society make the subject of the first book of this inquiry. Whatever the actual state of the skill, dexterity, and judgment with which labor is applied in any nation, the abundance or scantiness of its annual supply must depend, during the continuance of that state, upon the proportion between the number of those who are annually employed in useful labor and of those and that of those who are not so employed. The number of useful and productive laborers, it will hereafter appear, is everywhere in proportion to the quantity of capital stock, which is employed in setting them to work, and to the particular way in which it is so employed. The second book, therefore, treats of the nature of capital stock, of the manner in which it is gradually accumulated, and of the different quantities of labor which it puts into motion according to the different ways in which it is employed. Nations tolerably well advanced as to skill, dexterity, and judgment in the application of labor have followed very different plans in the general conduct or direction of it. And those plans have not all been equally favorable to the greatness of its produce. The policy of some nations has given extraordinary encouragement to the industry of the country, that of others to the industry of towns. Scarce any nation has dealt equally and impartially with every sort of industry. Since the downfall of the Roman Empire, the policy of Europe has been more favorable to arts, manufacturers, and commerce, the industry of towns than to agriculture, the industry of the country. The circumstances which seem to have introduced and established this policy are explained in the third book. Though those different plans were, perhaps, first introduced by the private interests and prejudices of particular orders of men without any regard to, or foresight of, their consequences upon the general welfare of the society, yet they have given occasion to very different theories of political economy, of which some magnify the importance of that industry is carried on in the towns, others of that which is carried on in the country. Those theories have had a considerable influence, not only upon the opinions of men of learning, but upon the public conduct of princes and sovereign states. I have endeavored in the fourth book to explain as fully and distinctly as I can those different theories and the principal effect they have produced in different ages and nations. To explain what has consisted the revenue of the great body of the people or what has been the nature of those funds which, in different ages and nations, have supplied their annual consumption, is the object of these first four books. The fifth and last book treats of the revenue of the sovereign, or commonwealth. In this book, I have endeavored to show, first, that what are the necessary expenses of the sovereign, or commonwealth, which of those expenses ought to be defrayed by the general contribution of the whole society, and which of them, by that of some particular part only, or of some particular members of it. Secondly, what are the different methods in which the whole society may be made to contribute towards defraying the expenses incumbent on the whole society, and what are the principal advantages and inconveniences of each of these methods? And thirdly and lastly, what are the reasons and causes which have induced almost all modern governments to mortgage some part of this revenue or to contract debts? And what have been the effects of those debts upon the real wealth, the annual produce of the land and labor of the society? Scene. Oh, that's long and complicated. 
Uh, and also, I forgot that old-timey writers really seem to like their compound sentences. Uh, with a bit more preparation and practice, I could probably make some of those long sentences sound a bit more comprehensible if I knew what parts went where and where particular sentences were going. Uh, oh, and I forgot last time. I think it's in the terms of service of... Uh, uploading videos to YouTube that I have to tell you to remember to like, comment, and subscribe. Bye!